Seattle at the 19th Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections, and we're going to be discussing hepatitis C today, which has been um, unusually for CROI, one of the, one of the major topics um, that we've been hearing about this week. My name is Liz Heileman from HIV and Hepatitis.com, and today I have with me uh, Kenneth Sherman from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and Douglas Dietrich from um, Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. So um, the first thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is we, we saw some studies um, yesterday about two new hepatitis C um, protease inhibitors that were approved this past year, and um, they were approved for people with hepatitis C only. We call mono-infected um, previously, but now we have some data in people that are HIV, HIV positive who we refer to as co-infected HIV and hepatitis C. So can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, the two protease inhibitors, which are known as a telaprevir or brand name um, Incivec? and the other is um, uh, Bocepravir and the brand name Victrellis. So if you could tell us a little bit about your studies for those. Okay, I guess I'll start since, I, since our, the, the Telaprevir study was first. Um, uh, it was, um, and actually this is wonderful news for everybody with uh, HIV and hepatitis C because we um, have, this is the first demonstration of SVRs, SVR, you know, the cure. SVR 12, actually, because the, um, the authorities have now adjusted with the way we look at uh, uh, hepatitis C in terms of uh, endpoints. So we can now use 12-week endpoints instead of waiting 24 weeks. And this weeks is somebody who still has undetectable hepatitis C virus right. 12 weeks after they finish treatment. So it's undetectable at week 12. On, you don't have to wait for undetectable at week 24. So this is both studies actually were able to show us SVR 12 data uh, in telaprevir. Uh, study was divided into two parts. It had part A and part B. One with uh, the part A was with no antiretrovirals. Um, part B was with either uh, afavirenz or boosted atazanavir. Okay. And the afavirenz patients um, were required to take a higher dose of telaprevir, 1125, three times a day or Q8 hours instead of um, just 750 okay. Q8 hours. Uh, overall, the results looked very promising for telaprevir. Everybody got 12 weeks of telaprevir triple therapy or placebo. No, um, no one takes telaprevir for more than 12 weeks okay. uh, in, in the mono-infected world or the co-infected world. And the, um, the SVR for the control group, SVR 12, was 45%. Uh, SVR 12 for the telaprevir group was 74%, which was actually just about the same as in mono-infected patients okay, in, the, in, the same, in, in the same range. So it was remarkably similar. The other good news is the side effects were nothing different than we had seen in the mono-infected group as well. They were very comparable. So comparable cure rates, comparable adverse event rates. So it's, it's all good news, Excellent. basically. Excellent. And do you want to tell us a little bit about the Bocepravir study, one of, either one of you? Sure. I'll try and address that. The, the study was presented yesterday by Mark Solkowski, uh, and I was an investigator at one of the sites that enrolled patients in that study. Uh, the study looked at a group of treatment-naive, co-infected patients uh, who were treated with Bocepravir, peg interferon, alpha-2b, uh, and weight-based ribavirin. Um, the patients uh, were treated for a total length of 48 weeks, uh, as with the labeling of Bocepravir, uh, a subset of that time uh, included the Bocepravir triple therapy, and uh, then the patients continued with peg interferon and ribavirin. Um, the uh, overall result in that study was uh, the study is not yet completed. so. There was overall slightly over 60% SVR rate, um, and that was significantly higher than uh, a control arm of the standard peg interferon ribavirin patient responses. Um, again, showing excellent rates of response and comparable to what we've seen in uh, mono infection studies. Uh, and particularly so because there are still some patients that are clear at week four but did not yet achieve the SVR 12 criteria. And so assuming, assuming those continue, we should end up in uh, roughly the 65% the SVR range 
um, with uh, somewhat similar proportions of success versus control in both of the studies for bosepravir and telaprevir, uh, indicating that both of these are quite viable agents. Um, some of the, the most important and interesting news related to that study has to be tied to some recent data uh, regarding drug-drug interactions that was found between bosepravir and some of the boosted PIs. The HIV PIs. The HIV PIs. And uh, that, uh, that though the healthy volunteer drug-drug interaction studies suggested that uh, there was a significant decrease in certain agents um, in their drug levels because of P450 metabolism and, and interaction between the two agents that, uh, in fact, looking at HIV viral breakthrough in those patients that had been controlled, there was no difference between the patients on peg interferon ribavirin and those patients that uh, had received bosepravir, which at least theoretically could have exposed them to viral breakthrough. So we saw good success, excellent results in the, uh, in the treatment responses for hep C and no signal of, uh, of a concern despite the concerns raised by the drug-drug interaction studies. That's good news for both of those. Now, right now, um, both uh, telaprevir and bosepravir are uh, approved in the U.S. and Europe for, for um, hepatitis C mono-infected people, but um, uh, clinicians are allowed to prescribe them for, for co-infected people if they, if they see fit. So what would, what would sort of your advice be now, um, given the lack of, of, of approval uh, about for, you know, for doctors and patients that are thinking about maybe using these for, for co-infected patients? Well, I think if the patients need to be treated now, they need to be treated now. If they have significant liver disease, I think it's definitely uh, indicated uh, to go ahead. Stage three disease, stage four disease, um, I think it's perfectly, you know, perfectly appropriate to use either uh, bosepravir or telaprevir as long as you're cognizant of the drug-drug interactions and uh, um, and you know and the increased dose of, with the fabrins, for instance, of telaprevir. Also, raltegravir it looks like is a very safe drug. Okay. In terms, so a combination of Truvada, raltegravir would work with either bosepravir or telaprevir. Okay. And what would, what would you suggest that um, a clinician might want to monitor to make sure that, you know, the patient's doing well on this combination given the, the sort of shortage of data we have right now? Um, both HIV viral loads and hepatitis C okay. viral loads together. Um, I think you have to do that, you know, quite uh, frequently. Also, considering the fact that the bosepravir pill count is 12 pills a day and the right, telaprevir right. one is, is either six or nine pills a day, Patients could have some confusion about their pills, you know, with their antiretroviral regimen if it's complicated. So I think right. that might add, we add to a little bit of worries to make sure they're taking all their medicine uh, and they're both the viral loads are remaining undetectable. I think there are some practical <coughs> issues and concerns. Uh, first, uh, insurance has proven to be somewhat difficult in most locations in getting these medications for patients with, with HIV because there's not a specific approval in those right. groups. And so uh, I think that in many places, uh, healthcare providers will struggle with uh, attempting to get the medicines, which are quite expensive. Yeah, Managed Medicaid in particular in New York State, Ken has has denied um, actually HIV patients, okay, so denied protease inhibitors for HIV patients because it's not approved by the FDA. And, and we have not struggled. Not covered by AIDS drug assistance programs right. yet. We don't right. know if they will be. And we've right. struggled in Ohio as well with uh, getting medications. Also, the, the alternate dosing that uh, Doug mentioned that's required in the patients who are on efavirenz mm -hmm. require additional pills. And uh, many of the uh, specialty pharmacies have been quite stingy in the way that they distribute the drugs exactly as the label says, right. which right. makes it difficult to obtain the extra doses of drug that are needed to increase the dosing. That levels. was just the phone. That was the phone call that I just got right before we started. <laughs> was exa exactly that uh, okay. that uh, issue. Okay. Um, now, as everybody knows, with the uh, with the current, um, these two drugs now need to be used with the current standard of care or the sort of outgoing standard of care, which is pegylated interferon and ribavirin, which can be 
quite dif difficult in terms of both side effects and the fact that you have to um, inject uh, pegylated interferon. So everybody's starting to talk about interferon-free all oral regimens. And we heard a little bit of data at this conference about, about one of those regimens in um, HIV-negative people and at the liver disease or the liver meeting in the fall and then upcoming the liver meeting in, in Europe in, in April, and we're, we're starting to hear more. So what, what, what do you want to tell us about all oral regimens and what we might expect in, in that field? And I think probably before we start talking about all oral regimens, we probably ought to start talking about the, the second wave of protease inhibitors that are being studied mm -hmm, in HIV mm -hmm. patients and in uh, and the, sec and the NS5A. So we saw data yesterday in the same group of presentations on the pharmacokinetics of uh, interactions with TMC-435, right. a second right. wave protease inhibitor, There's all, which is actually a, the clinical trial for HIV patients is just about finished accruing mm. now, the phase two trial. The phase two trial for Beringer-Ingelheim protease, both of which, are, by the way, are once a day, right. Tebatec and VI, right. and both of which are uh, have way fewer side effects than uh, telarapavir. However, they're still used with interferon right. and ribavirin. Right. And I know and, the advocates have been have been happy that that company has done some of these drug drug <coughs> interaction studies um, before mm -hmm. taking them into co-infected patients, because then we hopefully won't have any surprises like we saw with the with the bisepravir and HIV right. protease inhibitor. And actually, there's a third trial that's just beginning. Um, actually, it's, it, actually, it's already begun. Phase two. Uh, the BMS NS5A plus PEG and ribavirin, uh, and that, that actually has very also very few drug interactions, and actually all HIV drugs are allowed, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. with the exception of a combination of non-nuke plus protease, which you have to dose adjust for for P450 interaction. But that has to be used with PEG and ribavirin mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. But it's much easier to these other three proteases, the two proteases and the NS5A are much easier to use. Um, than telaprevir or bosaprevir. Right, right. One final thing that we should mention, both the studies that Ken mentioned with bosaprevir and that, uh, I, that I presented that with, with um, telaprevir were not response-guided therapy. Okay. They were 48 weeks total of therapy for both. So with, the, with <clears throat> HIV um, or hepatitis C mono-infected people, the, the, the indication is such that if people have a good response early on, they can perhaps take their treatment for a shorter shorter duration is what the, the response guided is. So, And that's in monotherapy. In mono-infected hep C patients, that's the standard of care. But all these new protocols, including the phase three protocols for bosepravir and telaprevir, are all response guided and therapy in HIV and yeah, co-infected wow. patients. So if they are negative at week four, they have the opportunity to stop early at week 24. And any sort of... Um, Predictions, I guess, about the the, the hope for uh, interferon-free therapy in the future. Well, you know, you, it's coming you, sometime. You, you asked that question, and uh, <laughs> that that's sort of the next generation right. beyond. Uh, there was a lot of excitement following uh, ASLD in November about interferon-free regimens, but uh, we've also seen some. Uh, some areas of concern and caution in that development as well. Uh, at this meeting, there was a, a report about null responders treated with uh, uh, the uh, nucleoside analog that Gilead has now, the original Pharmacet drug. Right, GS uh, 7977, they are calling and, it. Uh, and that agent uh, resulted in excellent on-treatment responses in that group of patients with genotype 1 disease, uh, but a, a very high rate of relapse in, in a small group of patients, nine described so far, one I guess still right. remaining, but right. eight of nine patients relapsed. Uh, and that is a, a little bit concerning, mm -hmm. suggesting that uh, that at least for the durations that people were hoping to achieve, these agents uh, uh, are probably not going to be effective in what we've classically thought of as the more difficult patient. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, the combination of the uh, BMS compounds, uh, the uh, NS5A with their protease inhibitor, uh, were also studied in prior null responders. and. And on the positive side, it was it was originally the first proof of concept that you can cure patients. Mm -hmm. But on the negative side, uh, 
seventy uh, percent of patients didn't respond. Right. So right. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of hope and a lot of promise, but for those in in this community that need treatment, we we are entering the phase of having very effective treatments not always easy to take, mm -hmm. but very mm -hmm. effective treatments, and we don't want patients to to give up that opportunity, particularly for those with with advancing liver mm -hmm. disease, so that in the hopes of, wow, that the we great thing will come, come because that great thing has always been delayed again and again and again, mm -hmm. and Doug and I have lived through this now for... Many, many uh, generations. Yes. Yes. I know, I know we're likening <laughs> sort of the situation with hepatitis C now to what we saw with with HIV in the in the early 90s when there was no good drugs and then there was you know one at a time drugs coming on and then finally combination therapy and, and well it's it's, gun, it's, it's gun HIV or, it's HIV drug development though at warp speed there yes. are many many okay. different combinations of many drugs but that doesn't mean that we're going to have that magic bullet without interferon so clearly you know for 12 weeks that you know clearly right. that's not enough for null responders okay 7977 ribavirin for 12 weeks is not enough for for you know it's only 11 percent at SVR4. Right, right. That's a good so, note of caution. So, I think, yeah. you know, there, there are people that are sort of like thinking the brand new interfere-free combinations are yeah. right around the corner. No, so. no, 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 no. There's five, yeah, six years we, maybe, we, and then we then they have to be HIV approved by the FDA for HIV patients, right? right? right. So they have to be tested in HIV patients as well. So because we were just saying we can't get them for HIV patients. So we'll, we're always going to be a generation behind in treating right. HIV patients. Right. So we'll be, once these the phase threes are completed with telaprevir and bosaprevir in two years, we'll probably be able to get those two for HIV right, patients. Right. But the, by then, T TMC yes. and BI will be approved for mono-infected patients, but not for co-infected right, patients right. yet. And then, of course, we'll be moving on to the maybe the hope of interferon-free uh, further down the line. Right. But yeah, that's why I think we're both saying if they need to be treated yeah. now, they need to be yeah. treated now. Um, and But we can at least put them in a clinical trial and stop in... Uh, 24 weeks if they respond well. Okay, um, well that's that's excellent news. Even though there's there's some cautions and, and caveats, it sounds like um, things are better than we've heard for many years for for co-infected people and people with hepatitis C alone. Is there sort of to wrap up any kind of um, concluding thoughts you might you might want to want to give in terms of advice for patients, the need for guidelines, what we might look to in the future? Um, I could start with that uh, first to re-emphasize people who who have HIV should be tested for hep C if they haven't been tested in the past and if they have hep C then then they need to be staged in some manner to determine how much hepatic fibrosis they have mm -hmm. if they have advanced disease then not only is there a greater imperative to treat sooner rather than later but there are other things that have to be addressed, including uh, a risk of bleeding varices uh, and development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, we still continue to see patients coming in uh, with large hepatocellular carcinomas that, uh, that were never screened for and therefore weren't caught at a time and a stage when they could be dealt with in a manner that it would include transplantation or transplantation combined with some other surgical resection procedure. Right. We all know how, how difficult um, that is because of the shortage of... And, and there is data that suggests, not surprisingly, that, that the amount of, of cases, the number of cases we're seeing and will see with patients with hepatocellular carcinoma is is about to blow wide open and rise dramatically and and that includes and probably is even more important in the co-infected population mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, it's important that people be identified screened and managed uh, and then treated when appropriate I, as a final note i would just quickly add that i think i would appeal to our guideline writers for the in the u.s the ias usa and uh, and DAIDS, guidelines writers for HIV, that we get these this really good data that we just saw yesterday uh, in, written into the guidelines that may help us get the drugs actually sooner from our ADAPs and our Medicaid managed HMOs. Okay, well thank you very much, uh, Kenneth Sherman and Douglas Dietrich, and um, that's it for us here at uh, Conference on Retroviruses and Opportunistic Infections in Seattle.